Um, I'm Jeff Asaf from ICG Advisors in LA. I want to start with a macro thing. So we've got China, Taiwan, rumblings, noise, whatever. The Middle East obviously is a big deal and horrific um, and unstable and scary. Um, you've got Ukraine and Russia, and are we leaving Ukraine or are we not? We've got an election coming up that's crazy with a lot of a lot of extremism on both sides and a lot of noise and a lot of uh, fear. You got, I live in California, you got the state of California that's trying to shut everyone down in business and have nobody live there anymore and I'll move here. So you got all this crazy stuff going on in the world, but if you didn't read the newspaper, or didn't look at the internet, and all you did was look at the markets, you'd think things are pretty great because the stock market's up and interest rates feel like they're coming down and everybody's happy and they're making money and memories are short. And so I wanted to open this with you guys and say, as Armin said to me, like, what's up? What gives? I don't, why, is, why does the market seem to be behaving so, in such an accommodating way and so well when everything feels so crummy? Not well. Frightening. Dan. You, you left out potential World War III. Okay, I mean, great. Least, okay, cool things like that. I think at the end of the day, these things don't really matter. I mean, uh, all these world event things, they're noise, they live in the background. Occasionally, one of these things will metastasize into something that, in the, even, even COVID, it was a one-month event, we came back. But what really matters is, is the economy growing, are people working, and what's happening with inflation, what's the Fed gonna do? And by all those metrics, I think things look pretty good. I mean, we seem to be heading towards a soft landing, if a landing at all. The Fed's backing off. Uh, all the data around inflation is very favorable. So, you know, this is one of those don't fight the, the tape times. And, um, that's why I think what the markets, there's this sort of coming around. And at the same time, I think positioning in equity markets has been, people have been underinvested. So there's the, the catch up. So, you know, I think it's a relatively benign time. It doesn't mean every stock's gonna go up, but it's, uh, and it's a very good time to be an equity investor. And on the credit side, um, you know, it's tough right now. It's tough to, in the public credit markets, it also reflects what's going on with the credit in the equity markets uh, with, bonds at almost all time tights, so. Okay. I mean, I, w I, I would say the, the you know, the, when we're going in order, or can we just go? Yeah, anyway, go. I didn't, I didn't show up, so. I was like, <laughs> yeah, that's right. The, um, you know, the market's pretty smart. The, um, every single time there's events, to Dan's point, they come in with effectively unlimited liquidity pretty quickly. And 2008, 2009 took a while for us to get it right, but there's a whole host of things that we can do at any given time to provide liquidity to the system. And so the markets really discount the left tail way differently than they used to. So uh, before, when you don't have those liquidity things in place, when the willingness to print five, seven, ten trillion dollars, trillion dollars, you know, we're not exaggerating, that's how much capital they'll put in if there's ever some sort of event. And now you have rates at a place where there's a ton of room to actually, if there is any sort of big hard landing event, there's so much room to actually provide stimulus to the system that they just price, they just price the left tail bad scenario differently. And so if you all of a sudden have some of the technical things that Dan was talking about and tact, tact just the way the market was positioned, and then you kind of have this thing in the background where all of a sudden you're gonna price some probability of rate cut, you have this just ton of liquidity coming to the system that doesn't really need a ton of liquidity to the system, and you have no fear with respect to, to these bigger events, and you have earnings growth, which for now the market's saying is going to be up and to the right, um, that's kind of brought us here over the last, last couple months. Yeah, and I would just add we're, we're a bit of in a Goldilocks scenario where people who are GDP focused have something to like, you know, GDP's positive and growing doesn't look like we're heading into a, you know, a hard recession uh, or even a recession at all. So uh, folks that are, that are focused on GDP have something to like. Folk, people who are focused on rates 
They have something like um, you know, inflationary focused people. They have something like they, you know, CPI is under control. And when you uh, real time uh, shelter data, uh, you actually get to a CPI picture that looks a little bit better than, than what the headline number would suggest. So when you have this sort of not too cold, not too hot, um, investors are attaching to whatever piece of that that gives them a bull story. And I think John's exactly right. I mean, there's, we have a loaded gun in terms of the Fed having a tremendous capability to lower rates if there is a shock. Um, and between that and the playbook that was brought out during the GFC uh, and since with COVID, I, I think there's a, um, a seemingly unlimited appetite to make sure that the U.S. economy doesn't falter to the extent policy could, could shift that. I mean, the only thing I would add um, that I'm actually surprised hasn't been mentioned is, is real estate and real estate debt. Um, you know, I think you hear the, the, this group and you hear, the, you know, relative complacency. Um, clearly, no one here owns any commercial real estate levered. Uh, and there's a lot of real estate that's owned levered. And I think if you talk to someone who has to refinance that, um, I don't think it's quite as complacent. Uh, I, I do think it can be relatively contained. Um, I don't think it necessarily is going to drag down everything. But I, I do think, um, you know, if you look at bank balance sheets, if you look at you know, folks that own that real estate, um, even in a benign environment, even in a soft landing, even if we've seen the highs in 10 year, um, you know, any real estate that was f bought in 2019 to 2021, 2022, you know, was financed with two or 3% debt with cap rates of four and a half or 5%, I don't see that world coming back anytime soon. And so I, I do think that is an area that will you know, provide stress, and I think if you do look back um, at last this time last year, you know, in the Silicon Valley Bank, and, and you know that that time and how much volatility that put in the markets, that was with three banks that had gross asset liability mismatch. That was very different than real credit issues. So, I, I don't. I think that is going to have to play out. There is a you know, there's going to be a reckoning, and I, and I do think that's um, how contained it is. I think is TBD. Yeah, I want to get back into real estate more in a bit, but we started investing in private credit in 02 and then really started doing it in 06 and then turned it into a business 10 years later. You guys just amped up, you guys just recently increased, I'm like, one didn't generally think of your firm as credit and you recently, not too long ago, added more firepower there. Which suggests you see, yeah. I mean, these are an opportunity. opportunity. These, these aren't. These are businesses where we've put together the teams and the initial capital, but we haven't created businesses. These people are giants in this industry. I'm just a little spec compared to them, but we will be getting into it, and we'll have our own little, you know, our own approach to doing that business. Yeah. So the, where I'm going with this is, I, I read this stuff about people saying private credit is going to blow up. It's overexposed. There's too much people, too much money chasing, blah, 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 blah. And then I hear other guys that say that's complete nonsense. There's lots of opportunity. Then you get guys like Zito at Apollo who's doing investment grade private lending, which is a ilk of it. But I'd like to spend just a couple minutes with you guys. It seems like there is, if this is a, well, I'm trying to use an analogy that works for everybody, but if this is uh, par five, we've only hit one or two balls, and there's plenty to go in terms of runway for expansion of opportunity to put money to work in private markets, whether it's investment grade or otherwise. Anyone who wants to jump on that? Let me just complete the thought that, okay. so we've been, just to be clear, we've been in credit for, I started Third Point as a credit fund. Right. So we've been in public corporate credit, we've been in structured credit and emerging market credit. And you know, I felt like we sort of missed the, we, uh, thus far we had missed the boat on the private credit side, but it's very much an adjacency to something that we've been doing for decades. And I think as we go out there and we see opportunities around refinancing and some of the deals that have been done that will need to be, there's a, you know, it's a huge market. It's a, you know, trillion and a half dollar market. And, you know, given that we have been in the public credit markets, it's, it's different, but it's, it, it's a logical shift for us from what we were doing, but we see, you know, the same, kinds of opportunities that these folks see in a huge market that will continue and you know, there's also a big demand from the investor side for that product. Yeah, maybe I could jump in, but um, 
Private credit means a lot of different things. It, it's not just lending to private equity sponsors doing LBOs. I mean, it includes rescue lending. It includes real estate debt. Um, there's all flavors in between, between the sort of plain vanilla, um, you know, unitronch levered buyout to you know, life sciences direct lending and, and everything, and, and structured credit as well, pr private asset backed finance. Um, in any given period or short period of time, there may be uh, more capital than there are opportunities. Um, that was, I would say, generally the case in parts of the private credit market in 2023, where uh, M&A deal volume was down materially year over year because base rates were, were pretty high and spreads had widened a little bit in direct lending. And so willing uh, sellers and willing buyers just couldn't connect because the cost of financing was, was eating up so much of the return in, in, in making the acquisition. Um, uh, but that's over a short period of time. If you look at over a long period of time, what you would see is that there's a tremendous amount of dry powder in private equity in need of a solution in private credit as well as the public markets. The public markets ebb and flow. Sometimes the banks are shut down, like in 2022 when they suffered pretty material losses from syndication failures. Um, so that's going to that's gonna move. But over the long run, there are many multiples in terms of dry powder in private equity versus private credit. Um, separately, if you look at rescue lending, even though we painted a rosy picture here um, on the stage in terms of the markets and the economy, with or without a recession, there is a tremendous distressed opportunity ahead of us, and most of that will be in privately negotiated bilateral loans for overlevered borrowers that need some combination of equity or debt or hybrid equity to come in and delever balance sheets so that they could actually uh, cash flow at the current rate environment or with the current rate environment and given uh, the stresses over the last several years between COVID and inflation, there are balance sheets that are bloated relative to their income power. And so if you are um, a, um, an equity investor or a, a credit investor that has the underwriting capabilities, the history to understand difficult situations and structure through them, there is a many multi-billion dollar uh, private credit opportunity through opportunistic or distressed investing. And again, it's, it's like, it's, like it, it's, it's in a way that it doesn't resemble what it looked like in the GFC. In the GFC, you know, Oak Tree was buying public credit for the most part and just restructuring and taking control over businesses. I think in the next two or three years, most of our activities will actually be in the private markets, again, doing consensual rescue lending. Yeah, what you're gonna hear here is, is um clearly a, a disconnect sometimes around what the definition of private credit is. Um, I went on Wikipedia the other day and I looked up private credit and it says, it's like one paragraph that says it's middle market direct lending. And you can hear Armin talking about you know, other things. You know, we really define it as, as a $40 trillion marketplace and really anything that doesn't have a QCIP that historically have sat on a bank balance sheet or insurance company balance sheet that, that really is historically a majority investment grade. Um, there's been lots and lots of ways to define this. I think we're all trying to figure out exactly what does it mean. I'm sure all you guys are trying to figure out what it means. Um, so we've, we've really tried to start with what, what does it mean, and it can be everything from what Armin and Dan are talking about to, to actually uh, the investment grade side of the balance sheet, which historically was the banks and insurance companies. And that's where there's a, a material you know, imbalance that's coming, and that's where you're going to earn excess spread. It's on a per unit of risk basis. It's not going to earn you... 11, 12, 13% on levered, like some of the stuff that, that, that we'll talk about today. Um, but it's going to earn you excess spread because you have 4,000 banks in the US. The top 10 banks made 65% of all the earnings of all the banks last year. So they're gonna, they have a problem. And what, and what everybody's realized is that post SVB and plus a trillion dollars of deposits coming out, there wasn't a big enough backstop actually. Um, and, not, not, and, and the FDIC and others don't want to deal with that. So you're going to see lots of changes to the capital structures of banks. You're going to see multi-hundred billion dollar raises of both, of both hold co-capital at the banks and, and risk transfer off the banks and full businesses coming out of the banks and forced mergers. And I think it's going to be a multi-generational opportunity in, in, the, in this from going from 4,000 to 2,000 to 1,000 banks. And it's going to be predominantly in the investment grade space to get returns that you know, historically alternative investors want, you're probably gonna have to use some, some amount of leverage, so it'll be about structure. Um, but it's gonna expand at a pace that I don't think anybody's seen. We've had to, the hard part about the asset-backed business and a lot of these smaller loans is you need lots of people. 
So operationally, we're not really set up for that historically. We've, in the last five years, we've hired outside of Apollo 4,000 originators that just do small balance mortgage, commercial loans, fleet loans, auto loans, a lot of things that you don't realize is Apollo, uh, but they're businesses that sit side outside of Apollo to really service where we think the world's gonna go. So again, you know, defining what private credit is, I, I think it's much broader. I think the asset classes uh, the, in, the, in the horrible golf analogy of hitting our first shot, I think we're still on the tee box. Sorry, Jeff, Good. you started with me. That's fine. Um, but uh, we're still on the tee box okay. and we're on the first hole. So um, I think there's still a lot more to do. And I, th and I think if you think about when private credit, you know, it existed before the financial crisis, but it was done by Goldman Sachs SSG and a handful of sort of private equity firms like ourselves. I think post-financial crisis, then you really had distinct, you know, separate uh, private credit funds that were raised, but you think about what they were filling, you know, the void they were filling, it was the void for big banks' balance sheets and the, the, the secular trends that are happening with these banks you know, if you think about it, 4,000 banks, I mean, how many banks are in Canada? There's, there's, you can count them on two hands. How many banks are all across Europe? U.S. is really an anomaly with the number of banks we have, and it's just, it doesn't make any economic sense. Um, so I think those trends are really just, just starting. The one thing I would say, and I'd love your guys' perspective, is I, I think the barriers to entry on building a new private credit firm are actually higher now than they were. It, it, you know, in 20. 12, 13, 14, 15, it seemed like then there were new startups and someone who'd worked at an investment bank could go raise a pocket of cash. I do think, and you gotta give Apollo and Athene credit for really helping to pioneer this, um, but being able to do some, provide some of these solutions allows you to differentiate yourself, and, and I would argue some of those situations are actually less competitive than some of the smaller situations. I so, agree. <laughs> no, you want to say something? Go. No, I was going to agree. He said he wanted our perspective. I agreed. Oh, okay. So, and I'll let you know. <laughs> so, and, and you guys, and also uh, Basel III, just to throw another yeah, a cherry yeah. on the Sunday. I mean, the bank's ability to make loans, even the big banks, is going down. And people, if you talk to people at the biggest banks, they're really concerned about this. This isn't just sort of a, you know, vague threat. This is something real. Yeah. yeah. I think the, the, the capital charge for a prime mortgage in 2007 for JP Morgan was 2%, right? They're gonna start in the new Basel endgame, and I don't know what will get approved, but you're talking about 13 to 14% for a regular way mortgage, which really is not, and I think that's really when you hear the, the disconnect between, again, private credit, they're talking about that type of activity, not the rescue loans or the leverage finance loans. They're, they're really talking about normal regular way um, activity, but but it's going to have a material shift. If you look at the capital required for all the activity we listed before, it's it's real. The the more the more the higher ROE will be for the banks to finance private credit managers mm -hmm. than it is to hold a whole loan on balance sheet under the current re under where the regime is going. It'll be pushing everybody into financing everybody, not really owning whole loan. So originating, owning the customer, advisory, and financing but not owning whole loan, which is a big difference in the business model. And it's happening now. I mean, this is not um, theoretical and we have to wait for the Basel endgame to actually play out. We are seeing regional banks materially reduce their lending activities across the board. It started with real estate. If you looked at um, you know, some of the exposures that they had in real estate, they're just, you could just tell that the bank just wants to shrink, it wants to retain capital, grow its equity base because of expected losses in real estate. But now there's this, you know. And they're like preparing? I, that's what it felt like, or what it feels like. I mean, they should. I think and, they should be. And it started with real estate, but then it extends to other asset classes. So, in our you know most recent discussions with some of the origination partners that we have in the asset backed finance area, we are finding that when they in places where they used to have financing from a regional bank, um, it's gone away. And now they're coming to us and saying, look, I used to get financing for this underlying asset class at 300 or 340 or 350 over. Would you do it at 550? Would you do it at potentially 600? Now, that's, uh, that's not across the board. That's not every originator. But you know, there, are, there are partners that we have that have been in business for 25 to 40 years providing loans to certain types of specialty, um, or they're especially lender providing loans to a certain type of consumer or client, small and medium-sized businesses. And that, um, uh, uh, the, the leverage that they used to get from a bank is now gone, from the, and they're looking for us for leverage, or they're looking for us for equity uh, to help support their origination activities. So it's already here. Well, 
well, and again, defining what private credit is, but if you think about why do I say there's barriers to entry, because to underwrite a bunch of consumer loans, to underwrite some of the stuff that's coming out of the asset-backed market, you can't do it with four people in a Bloomberg, right? You need to do it with, with big infrastructure and real teams. You know, I would also say, if you think about even in the more distressed opportunis opportunistic space, you know, we bought a portfolio last year from Capital One, and pre-financial crisis, that would have had, you know, Goldman Sachs, three deaths from Deutsche Bank, JP Morgan, B of A, and everyone on this table, and everyone on this stage bidding for it, there's just a lot less people that can really take on the operational complexity of you know, hundreds of different borrowers uh, across the country. And so I think that is, that, you know, that, and that's just hard to build that, that team. Okay, so this, th our country has a spending problem. We spend too much. I don't wanna argue about where it should be spent, but it's hard to disagree that we don't spend too much. And we spend more than we bring in, so therefore we borrow it. And for, for logical reasons, lenders are willing to let, give us the money. And so we just keep borrowing like there's no tomorrow. But at some point, I think the number I just heard is we're up to 36 trillion or some crazy ass number like that. Where is the breaking point? Where is the point where lenders to us, the people who buy our bonds, because obviously where government bonds trade sets the tone for all of the rest of this. Where's the point where people start puking this out and say, that's it, no more, or I want a higher return if I'm gonna lend you the money, and they don't care what the Fed's doing with the short rate, the short end of the curve, but the long end is just getting pushed up and up because the risk becomes, there's an assessment that this actually is risky, and that maybe these guys aren't gonna pay us back, and therefore we want a premium for it, it be, just becomes, Impossible. Is this like, is this a stupid, am I nuts or am I rational? And is there a point where it becomes too painful and we're in trouble? Well, I, w I would have thought we would have seen it. And so when, when, I, when, when I thought that we would have seen it was the October Treasury auction, where um, it actually went <laughs> surprisingly well. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason I thought that au that auction could be pretty disastrous was that the foreign buyers of U.S. Treasuries generally have not been growing their books in terms of how much in U.S. Treasuries they want to buy. But that particular auction was a surprise to the upside, I think, because so much stimulus was in the system. There was so much savings that made its way into um, you know, the hands of individuals, pension funds, corporate uh, treasuries. And so, you know, four to five percent treasuries were, you know, a, kind of a free lunch. So what we saw was that that auction went well because as that stimulus whipped around the economy and made its way into savings, that savings was deployed to help support the treasury in that auction. Now, I don't think that that's unlimited. I think that there will come a point in time where we, um, as, a, as a country, may not have the buyer base needed because if rates stay where they're at, um, we will exhaust that capacity, I think. It, it's hard to say when, but, and it's hard to say what the, what the response will be, but there are folks at Oak Tree who believe that the Fed won't actually ever let that happen, that we will see QE kick in uh, in advance of any sort of destruction like that that you would expect to see otherwise in the Treasury markets. Are you shaking your head in agreement? Well, I'd, I'd say or he's anybody crazy. who's going, no, anyone <laughs> who's gone around knows that we have, and this is going to be a USA, it's going to be what? Go USA chant right now. But I'd say we have by far the best capital markets in the world. There's no debate about it. I don't think it's close. If you look at what's going on in, with China's capital structures, with Japan's capital structures, with the European banking system, I don't think anywhere's close. I think we will always be able to finance ourselves for the limited time. Now, we have four and a half trillion of tax receipts. We are approaching over a trillion of interest. And we have a major entitlement problem. There's, that's the, and there's really not a great solution other than to cut the budget, which is really hard all the time. And we're not going to cut entitlements, so we're effectively going to borrow money. Um, what's been more shocking to me is that you could, everybody in the world can print no matter what, and there's been really no currency volatility for 15, 20 years, because everybody's printing at the same pace. Right? We always have the ability to, you know, Japan's kind of going through this you know, what's coming to the USA potentially and what's gonna happen, right? And they've effectively been able to get away. You've seen the currency move in the last 12 months for the first time, but you've seen them effectively cap yields because they had to, because they raised their gross debt so much um, in, in an effort to, to, to get inflation. Um, and that's, that's finally starting to come through. 
I think if it gets so bad, we'll end up putting yield controls. I know that's not a thing to say that, that people want to say. I think we'll put yield controls in place. I think we'll be forced to. Um, and it'll be a question of whether or not the markets allow us to do that with our currency. Um, that's really, for me, that's the question. I don't think they're just going to let interest rates go to six, seven, eight, nine percent because if they do that, the banking system's completely insolvent and then effectively real estate, all, all these asset categories, the bailout for that will be so much larger than capping rates that they'll be forced to effectively cap rates. I mean, they've, it's, it, we've already left, in, 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 in my opinion, we've already left the, the game of actually trying to delever. I think it's gonna be very hard. Okay. <laughs> I'm not getting quite the answer I want, but that makes sense. Okay, so I don't know how many of you heard this, but recently, half the stuff I read on, I don't know if it's actually really truly been said or if it's just somebody putting something on social media, but I saw a comment that Donald Trump said that if he is elected president, he's gonna slap a 60% tariff on all Chinese imports. Or exports? Did you guys see that? Does does anyone know if that's actually true, or is that just internet chatter? Well, if it is true, if it is true, I would imagine that would not be well received by the Chinese. And we have an extraordinary—I'm not saying it's healthy—but we have an extraordinary dependence on trade with China because we just because that's how we've allowed things to play out. So if we go down that path and do that. How does that affect our ability to function? And how does it affect their willingness? First of all, they're going to have presumably fewer, they'll have less money because of the taxes. They're buyers of our bonds. How does that fix? How does that get solved? How I, does I think it's a highly hypothetical question. It's like any statement made in the, in a, by anyone, let alone Donald Trump, in the midst of a, of a, a political race. You know, it's like asking questions about well, what if there's a wealth tax or what if, you know, people say these things are politically popular. I think it's way too soon to start coming up with scenarios as to what to do about a 60% tax. Let's see what happens in the election. Let's see what happens in reality. But, you know, I don't know about you guys. Not, I have a lot of other things I can occupy my mental space <laughs> with other than hypothetical, hypothetical political statements. Not that I'm trying to no, 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 minimize no. your question. I just think it's, you know, there's so much noise and clutter out there. I think we're all in the business of just, you know, clearing the decks of the clutter and focusing on the things that are relevant. Well, and I also think, um, I agree, you got to discount anything any politician says, and especially Donald Trump, but if you also look at what happened the last time, he talked a big game, there was, you know, a lot of draconian scenarios talked about some of the tariffs he was going to put on and ultimately the market worked through it. The other thing that I also think you got to um, realize that he's going to do is if it really does create a real problem, he'll change his mind. Like I don't think it's anything that's existential um, because China needs us as much as we need them because they've got right. and their economy is doing a heck of a lot worse than ours is. Okay, now let's jump into the real estate topic and the whole issue of the huge amount of commercial mortgages that are coming due, that are going to reset, and how that gets absorbed. Where does that, where does that come from, and how much of that turns in, results in literally abandonment and turnover, what we were talking about in the back? Well, I'll start, but it's, um, if you look at the maturity schedule for commercial real estate over the next four or five years, it's pretty consistent and pretty high. Yeah. So it's not like there's a wall that we're waiting for. The wall is here. And there are assets you know, going back to the bank. There are assets that are moving into special servicing. Um, the question is the resolution around those assets and the willingness of the existing equity owners to support the business or support, support well, the asset. Well, willingness and ability. Uh, yeah, serviceability. Now, the, what, what we're seeing is when um, assets in the commercial office space are going into special servicing or going into restructuring, Generally speaking, the owners of those assets are unwilling to provide additional capital support because usually those buildings, in addition to having a higher cost of debt, also have some level of vacancies that require tenant improvements to re-tenant, and they're just not in the business of putting good money after bad. So we are already seeing a lot of assets kind of turning over. Um, and for the most part, when, when we've seen those assets um, in, in, the, in the last you know, 12 or 18 months go to, go to servicing, the valuation is breaking through whatever mezzanine debt might have been outstanding be, uh, behind a uh, first mortgage, and the value is breaking inside of the first mortgage, and, and so just lenders are taking it back. 
um, and mezzanine providers are either losing their capital or stepping into the equity and providing a little bit of tenant improvements to, to come in. The hard part, I, I think, by the way, I think that rolls and continues. It's sort of a, um, you know, we talked about earlier, kind of like a, a rolling recession in this particular asset class where it's sort of sector specific issues, sector specific distress. I don't think that that necessarily stops in, in commercial office. The question really is in the other asset classes whether there's been enough rental growth to, to sustain a higher cost of borrowing, um, such that you know if you had a rate that was at four percent struck four, five, six years ago, and now you have to refin refinance at seven and a half, eight, eight and a half percent. You know, do you have have you had enough rental growth to sustain that new um, cost of borrowing? That's a lot of rental growth. And, and I think as a result, there are going to be there are going to be assets that sort of fall off the back of a truck. If you're a I don't think it's going to be just a bloodbath in multifamily or a bloodbath in industrial, but there will be high quality assets that have some idiosyncratic situation or issue in need of capital and with an owner who is out of the money. And that creates an opportunity for firms like ours uh, who track those markets, who have uh, the ability to offer private loans to, um, uh, to new buyers or, or even to existing sort of you know, refinancing of, of good assets. So there's, there's tremendous opportunity, but there will be, and there, there is turmoil, but I think the worst of that turmoil is actually yet to come in real estate. I mean, I think you can insert any asset class that was put to money in 2018 to 2021, private equity, venture, real estate, and even it financed itself with rates at zero, and in 21 it was really the worst because effectively it assumed that rates would be zero forever. And we haven't really taken the mark in terms of equity marks, whether it be real estate or, or private assets generally. And I suspect the next five years are gonna be extremely difficult for what that looks like for valuation. It's not gonna happen overnight. It's gonna be somewhat controlled. But I think you're gonna see lots of situations when the debt comes due that it's gonna be very hard to warrant anywhere close to where the valuations are today. So that's just gonna be, I think, a headwind for the industry. And you think that life cycle is another five years? I think it's, again, we have, we have about, in corp, I don't know the real estate numbers exactly, but in corporate, we have half a trillion due next year, probably a trillion due over the next three years. Yeah, in corporate, you actually do have a maturity wall that's sort of 18 to 24 months out when it starts yeah, to really like, ramp up. Yeah. And then, so the worst of the worst is breaking now, but the medium quality will also break if rates stay higher for longer. Well, and like venture, also venture, you know, you, a lot of, a lot, like good for venture, good for a, a lot of people over equitize their businesses in late 21. So lots of people raised extra money, they've cut costs, they've extended their runway. In, in venture, they don't have as much debt, so it's not really a, there, but there's just no exits, right? You have 50% of exits for 15 years was sponsor to sponsor, 30% was IPO, 20% was strategic. You had $2 trillion go out in PE between 18 and 21. Most investors expect half their money back by year five. We're approaching year five. They've gotten 200 billion back from the two trillion. So there's an $800 billion hole of money that people thought they were gonna get back but it's not getting back. Which that just is gonna create, you're seeing it. It's gonna be, it's gonna be fundraising pressure, it's gonna be valuation pressure, it's gonna be exit pressure. And I think all that is gonna flow back into the markets at some point because people are gonna realize that maybe the, the numbers that they have on the page aren't real. But right now, you haven't had to really take that. So you don't feel it in the spending. You don't feel it in the wealth impact. And the public markets are like, oh, things are great, right? So we'll see. I, I, I'm, I'm pretty negative uh, the outcomes over the next couple of years for, for how some of these things play out. Well, and I just don't think there's a way to avoid that reckoning in real estate because you actually have maturities. No, because you know when these the loans are, are and, and, and if you think about it, even though a bank wants to avoid a default, if they have a mortgage that's 3%, on a commercial office building that can't pay, they can't extend that mortgage. I mean, th th there's no way for them to do that and someone's gonna have to put that in. So you are gonna have empty buildings, you're gonna have you know, very severe recoveries on first mortgages, which is unheard of. And then you also, you know, Armin mentioned multifamily, which if you think about that, particularly for specific markets, those, those businesses should be doing well. The problem is they were financed with 2.5% mortgages and 4.5% cap rates on the exit and now their mortgage on the, on the takeout's gonna be 6%. And so it, just all the cash flow is gonna be sucked up. And you know, every multifamily sponsor right now is saying, 
yeah, there's going to be reckoning, but it's going to be the other guy. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, they all think it's the other guy. Um, so again, I, and I do think, I don't know if it's five years, you know, capital seems to form, but I, I don't think it's 12 to 18 months. I think it's, I think it's just. Yeah, I, th I think just thematically, big picture. Yeah. There have been a lot of tailwinds in the last, you pick, five to 20 years. You know, there's been no bigger effect on wealth creation than declining rates or ultra low rates for the last 20, 40 years. That's no longer the case. That type of asset value wealth creation is not available anymore. So that massive tailwind is now a headwind. Savings, for example, another uh, tailwind over the last few years, you know, coming out of COVID with all of the stimulus, that was a huge tailwind. A lot of spending, but if you look at the numbers, it peaked in February, March 2021 and has just been steadily declining. People are spending their savings. And so 2023 was surprisingly strong because the consumer was surprisingly strong. They had saved money, they continued to spend, their home prices were stable, everybody was feeling really, really good. And so 2023 surprised everyone to the upside. I think if you were, you know, if you were reading the press in late 2022, everyone said, there's gonna be a recession in 2023, rates will decline in 2023, neither of those actually happened. But if you look at savings today, savings are drying up. So that type of consumer spending is getting to the point where higher prices from companies raising prices can result in demand destruction. So that's kind of, a, again, another tailwind turning into a headwind. Um, so I, I, I just think that there's, I think we've seen sort of the best that this, uh, this, this um, hangover or, or from, from COVID stimulus, I think we've seen it play out. There's still some benefits through um, you know, corporate treasuries and pension plans having capital to invest in treasuries. But in terms of the health of the consumer, um, in terms of some of the fundamentals, I, you know, I, I could see things breaking to, to the negative which would then kind of lean on the Fed's ability or the Fed's willingness to be a little bit early to come in with rate cuts uh, to prevent a recession. If you look at the 2019 Powell Fed, they did reduce rates three times that year. There was not a recession, but there were trade issues with China that suggested a recession could, could occur. Um, and that Fed actually did reduce rates. So I think the bull, the bull side on the rate reduction is that some of these uh, headline numbers will, will, will trail off and the Fed will err on the side of being early. I'm not sure I believe it, but that is, I think, uh, the way the market, the way the bulls in the market are, are thinking about it. John, you guys, well, for all of you, I heard, I heard some, in one of the panels earlier today, someone said that the private equity market is larger than the public equity market? It is. Is that for real? Okay. Yeah. Is there more relative value in the public markets or the private markets? I, I don't know that, I mean, I guess I believe that statistic, but it did surprise me that that's true. And it made me wonder, like everybody, like this is an alternatives conference, right? It's the largest alternatives conference and the notion of buying the stock market is not what this gathering talks about, but is there more relative value in the public markets because so much has moved into the private? You send a, interior designer into a room and you send a security specialist into a room and you tell them to describe the room, are they, do they give you different answers? <laughs> Probably. Well, yeah. well, I'm, I'm Is it the same room? So, so oh, sorry, I, go ahead. Go, go ahead. No, I was, gonna, gonna, say, I, I was go. gonna speak for John as a shareholder. There you go, um, there you go, go ahead. Apollo's private, private equity business in the, in, in the 2000s was around 15 billion and your credit business was double digits, now it's half a trillion, and your yeah. private equity business is 25 maybe. I don't know if that's indicative of the entire market or the opportunity set or just the fact that you saw disproportionate opportunities in credit, but it is reflective. I, I know you guys are pretty commercial. If there were incredible opportunities in private equity, <coughs> you would be pressing that as well. Yeah, I think, I think the, the question also is existing private equity in the ground, your question, or new money private equity? Because I think, because Right, deals that are getting done now, new deals will get financed with less debt than they used to. They'll probably be less cyclical. My guess is that those deals will be underwritten to probably more bearish assumptions than deals that were underwritten in 18, 19, 20, and 21. So when they talk about the size of the market, a lot of, those, a lot of that market already has been marked to evaluation that I think is probably not reflective of some of the risk with, with respect to their capital structure. Whereas new money in private equity, I think they're still great great opportunities, 
but it's not a, to Dan's point, it's a mature business. It's a mature business that you're gonna find deals, you know, five, seven, 10 deals maybe a year, and you'll invest the fund over three years, but it's not gonna be at the scale that you can lend money and multi-generational imbalances between a banking system that has to delever, a real estate system that has to delever, a venture system that has to revalue, these things all have to come back, and I think all of those returns are gonna to accrue to new money, probably in the lending space than it is gonna be as an equity investor. Um, I think the public markets, I don't know, again, the public markets are so, they've become so seven, 10 stock centric mm -hmm. that it's hard to just talk about the public markets in some big, large general focus, and Dan, will, Dan is, the most experienced up here of, of investing in, in public public stock, so I'll leave it to him. But again, I, I'm kind of a, I'm a believer there's always value in the public markets at some point or misunderstood things in the public markets that you actually can transact on if you have the right investment philosophy and process that you sometimes can't do in the, in the private markets. I, I think, right, like when COVID hit, if you're a private only, per, you have to be a private and public, you have to be both. Like when COVID hit, if we were just a private lender, a private credit, we would have put no money to work. We, we bought 45 billion in March and April of, of 20, right? If we had just done only private, nothing happens. Um, so the ability to go private public, I think you need that in the toolkit or else you really won't thrive in the next couple of years. Okay, so before we wrap it up, um, there's four guys I'm interested in this answer. How many rate cuts in 2024? Start with Z and move down this way. One and a half. One half. One and a half. Cuts. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'd say two, but two. I mean, it depends how big they are, but I'd, I'd be a, Well, that's fair. Of course. I'm, I'm saying 25, 25, 25. 25. 25. Three. Three. You? You. <laughs> what do you got? I, I'm not a panelist. <laughs> My opinion doesn't matter, your opinion matters. All right, we're done. Thanks everyone. Thank